Let's get into opal. Great day to discuss this gemstone. Again, not one that's often faceted, but instead carved and turned into polished cabochons, much like jade. In culture, opal features fairly prominently in North America. It is our October birthstone. When you think about opal, you probably think about white opal, but that's not necessarily the only type. There are a number of different um, varieties. Oh, we should do number two under culture, and that is it is the best known of the phenomenal gems. And when I say phenomenal gems, I'm not referring to it being awesome, although it is, right? Phenomenal has to do with phenomenon, things that play with light in different ways. And what opal has is something called opalescent, opalescence. In the gem world, this is called play of color. This has been recognized for thousands of years. The Romans treasured opal. When you think about play of color, this is, of course, what you're picturing. This is a beautiful version of opal from Ethiopia, a very important new source of opal. And you can see these large flashes and domains of color that give the play of color. Anytime there's something you want to look up more, always please feel free to take a look at Wikipedia, which is where this image comes from, because they are a great source and it's maybe 25 to 50 percent of my lecture material is actually coming from Wikipedia. So our varieties of opal are many. It's not just white opal. In fact, the most common type of opal, or the most precious type of opal, so there's two different there's precious opal, and then there's a whole other category we're going to put down here, which is called common opal. Common opal is the material that does not have any play of color, and it's actually sometimes called potch. Oh man, am I getting ahead of myself talking about potch before I talk about all the different types of non-precious opal? In fact, sure, I am getting ahead of myself. Here's another image from Wikipedia showing a version of common opal. You can see the smooth, nice luster of opal here, but there is no play of color. That is not worth much money at all, but it is very common in the rock record. It's not a rare gemstone. It's this opalescence that makes opal rare. So of our different varieties, the most expensive type of opal is called black opal. And this is where the background color is dark gray to black. Background color, dark gray to black. And what ends up happening, the reason why this is the most valuable type is because this background color allows for the opalescence or play of color to be the most pronounced. It's highly coveted in Japan. They've bought most of it. And so it actually doesn't even come to the United States all that often because jewelers in the United States recognize that the, United, the U.S. consumer is not willing to pay top dollar for this material. U.S. consumer not willing to pay. That's the reality of black opal. I'll show you a picture of it in just a little bit. The next type of opal is called white opal. This is the type that is sold in the United States. It, here's an example of very fine, high quality white opal. And here now, the background is light gray to, to white. Okay, so it's maybe hard to tell, but this is a fairly transparent material that's sitting over a background, and that background is more white color. There is a type that is clear. This is called crystal opal, or it's also called water opal, referring to crystal clear backgrounds. So here we have clear background. This can be worth a lot of money, depending on if it has play of color. It may or may not have play of color. Not have play of color, P of C. We'll say black, this is our big, big money, and white is just marginal money. This is common opal, potch, has no money associated with it at all. All right, D, this is now 
This is worth about one-third the price of black opal, and it's worth more than white opal. It's called boulder opal. And boulder opal is not big boulders of opal, which is what the name implies. Instead, it's where you have veins or matrix of opal in a rock. Veins or matrix of opal in a rock. And so we actually, you have part of rock mixed with the opal. Uh, we'll see pictures of it in a little bit. And then the last type of precious opal is called fire opal. And what fire opal has is it is a red or orange stone. And it also may or may not have play of color. So those are our different varieties of opal. I suppose I should show you a couple more pictures. Uh, here's a picture of fire opal, highest end fire opal. This one's from, this is a picture from GIA. When it's this color red, it's called cherry opal. All right, so that's, and notice there is no play of color here, but it is a stunning shade. Let's take a look at, here's a boulder opal. From, Mont uh, from Nevada. This is a place in the United States where you can find opal. And you can see the opals occurring within pockets within this matrix. And then let's go to the most expensive type. Here's an image from Omi Prive, that jeweler that I like quite a bit. And it's hard, right? We have the blue and we have the green sectors making the opalescence play of color. But that's on top of a dark background. You can see that kind of coming through here and here. This is our most expensive type of opal. All right, let's move on to Roman numeral two, which is the mineralogy of opals. So let's see, we've got to go back to pen mode. Here's pen mode, Roman numeral two. Now this is our mineralogy. And we go through the same kind of stuff here for just about every gem. You probably know what to expect. Our composition of opal is very simple. It's hydrous silica. Hydrous silica. What does that mean chemical formula wise? You would call it SiO2 dot N H 2 O. Where N is some integer, we don't really know how much, but Different amounts of opal have different amounts of water. It can be anywhere from maybe 6 to 20 weight percent of the rock is H2O, which ends up causing a problem because it means it's unstable. If you heat opal, you can get that whole opal to break down. It's one of the problems. So that's composition. Let's go to a couple other things. Let's go to crystallography. Crystallography. And the answer with crystallography is that there is none. There's no crystallography in opal. It, we call this an amorphous solid. Or you'd even call it a mineraloid. Because it kind of looks like a mineral, but it doesn't satisfy all those five things for a substance to be a mineral. And instead what it is, is that it ha there is... um. There is some structure to it, depending on the type. So let's talk about the what is the structure of precious opal, and then compare it to the structure of potch, our common opal. And both of them are comprised of spheres. Okay, so but the difference between the two is that we have when I say spheres, they're silica spheres that are anywhere between 150 to 300 nanometers in size. So both of them are comprised of spheres that are all stacked upon one another. And the spheres are SiO2, right? They're silica spheres that are um, 150 to 300 nanometers or so in diameter or in yeah in diameter and the reason why we get a play of color in precious opal is because there's a three-dimensional structure so let's say three-dimensional structured network to the spheres of of nanometer let's go nanometer scale spheres and that's different than common opal. What you have with common opal is that you have randomly organized spheres. 
And with respect to our 3D structure network, it's both in terms of like orientation and size. So if you were to draw, here's um, just a really highly zoomed in, we'd want to draw a bunch of very similar sized spheres of silica that are all stacked upon one another. They tend to have a, what's called close packing, where they're, it's like you take a bunch of, I don't know, baseballs in a crate, how those would stack upon one another, that's how our spheres are stacking upon one another in precious opal. But in common opal, it's different. You have spheres that are big next to spheres that are small, and they're all just kind of superimposed on one another, and there's no real order. And that's going to affect how the light bounces off of each type, right? Where one gets a diffraction of light. We'll say this, diffraction, and giving you our play of color. That's the big source of color, really, is our structure. Uh, what other things do we always talk about in mineralogy? We talk about our physical properties. And so our physical properties, we'll just include both of them here real quick, it's hardness which ranges, it's around 5.5 to 6 on hardness scale. So it will hold the polish and it will hold up pretty well in jewelry. And then in terms of density, this is what's a little strange about it. It's a very light material, 2.15 grams per centimeter cubed. In fact, it's the lightest of all the gem materials. The reason for it is all this water in the, in the crystalline structure. And that water makes things very light. All right, let's go on to our geologic occurrences. Whoa, hello, where did that go? Come on back. All right, so D, this is going to be geologic occurrences. How does opal form and where does it form? That's the question we're trying to answer. And there's a number of different ways that opal can form. We're going to talk about the weathering theory. Because there's, of the mo many, this is the by far the most common way we think that opal forms. There's other ways. You can have hot water moving through the subsurface, and then silica precipitates from it. That makes a type of opal called sinter, and that's what happens at Old Faithful at Yellowstone. There are microbes that will eat SiO2 and secrete SiO2, and that'll make a microbial opal. That's not the type we're talking about here. Instead, let's talk about the weathering theory. In the weathering theory, it's all about precipitation and then evaporation. And so our setting is going to be any major desert area of the world, a desert area where the rocks in that desert are rich in silica. This could be a place with a lot of sandstone or maybe volcanic ash. These would be rock types that would be fantastic settings to make a lot of opal. And then there has to be in this desert seasonal rainfall. And that seasonal rainfall is going to affect the hydrologic system in the region. Okay, because and that's going to create our process, right? Hydrology drives our process for opalization. And the process is this, is that in the wet years or seasons, these silica rich waters fill fractures and open spaces in the subsurface. But then the next season occurs, and then what happens is the waters evaporate during episodes of drought. As the waters evaporate, then they precipitate. So it's that, it's that drought and evaporation that creates precipitation of silica spheres. And the first time that this happens is not going to make that thick of an opal deposit, but if you can repeat that year after year after year, right? Pete and repeat were sitting on the fence. Pete fell off. Who was left? Repeat. 
Oh, not a good joke. But you repeat that year after year after year, you can build up a significant deposit of opal. And that's the best idea for where the world's main opal deposits occur. Uh, here's an image of that process I snagged from GIA. We'll finish with this. We've got seasons of wet carrying silica-rich waters down deep into the subsurface. How deep? Well, it seems to be that it ends up being at like the kind of 10 to maybe 50 meter kind of depths, not terribly deep in the earth. We'll fill these areas with silica rich H2O. As the water table drops, we could write that, water table drops in these seasons of drought, we'll leave those areas to precipitate opal precipitates. Now if you wanted to pause the video here and sketch this, that would make for a good understanding of opal formation process. Actually, we'll stop here and I'll finish up with a little bit of a short video next.